Chapter 15, Loss, Grief, and End of Life Care. These are the theory objectives for this section of the chapter. These are the clinical objectives for this section of the chapter. Okay, so death is inev inevitable no matter what culture uh, you may be, what your culture may be. Death is um, inevitable. And so a lot of times it's expected that nurses should be immune and able to easily discuss death. But nurses are humans just like everyone else. And so it can be difficult for nurses to deal with death and dying, even if they are uh, nurses that primarily work in the critically ill, uh, work with critically ill patients or hospice patients or, you know, people uh, that are expected to die. You still get attached to your patients. You still, you know, have emotions that come along with um, death and dying because, like I said, we're all humans. Okay, so life and grief are a part of, um, you know, a, a part of your everyday life. And you're going to, you know, experience um, grief at some point. Your book talks about six stages uh, people experience when, they, uh, when they're going through various life changes. Status quo, so that means everything's going along normal you know, with the status quo or whatever. And then there's an introduction of a foreign element. So something turns your world upside down. Maybe you have a loss of a loved one. Maybe you have a loss of a job or, or whatever. Something turns your world upside down. So, and then you have chaos. So now is you, everything's in a chaotic stage. I got to figure out how to deal without having whatever it is I lost in my life now. Um, then there's integration. So now I got to integrate my new normal. I got to start integrating life without whatever it is I lost and practice. I have to practice that. I have to keep practicing uh, life without that. And then I develop a new status quo. So what's my new status quo now? Um, what's my new normal without that, whatever it is I lost? So what is loss? So loss basically means you no longer possess or have an object, a person, a situation. A lot of times when you think of loss, you think a loss of a loved one when someone dies or something. Yes, that is a loss, but um, that's not the only type of loss that can cause um, grief. Um, you can lose, um, when you talk about a situation, maybe you lose your marriage, you know, go through a divorce. Maybe you lose a job or, um, you know, we talk about loss of um, object or something like that. So it doesn't have to be um, just a loss of a, a person. Um, it could be a physical loss. Maybe you um, had an amputation, you lost a limb or something like that. And so um, only the person that's experiencing the loss can define what that loss means to them. Just because uh, the both of you lost a parent does not mean you both have the same feelings and emotions about the loss. I mean, one person could be glad that parent is gone. Maybe that parent abused them or whatever, and they're glad that parent is gone. Whereas another person, they were extremely close to their parent. And so they're having a lot of grief and emotions about that. So um, only that person that's experiencing that loss can define the value of that loss. Um, so never say, I know exactly how you're feeling because you don't know exactly how a person may be feeling over the loss of something. Um, you know, we talk about divorce just because several people have had divorces. Everybody. You may have experienced a divorce, but it, it still can, may not be the same for you as it was for someone else. So um, only that person knows. Now, you may have an idea, but you don't know exactly what they're feeling. Okay, so um, grieving is a normal 
a process or coping strategy for dealing with uh, with the loss. And so, um, you know, we have different models and things like that. We'll talk about one uh, particular model here for a uh, grieving process. But um, there's no right or wrong way for a person to grieve. And there's no set time frame uh, that's allowed for uh, for grieving. So it takes time. Like I said, you know, it's different for different people what that loss meant to that person, um, how much they value whatever it was that they lost so it could mean a lot of different things or or, or grieving can uh, take uh, different amounts of time for different people based on the value of that loss or whatever a bereavement is the state that um, of having suffered a loss or death so you um, in a state of bereavement after you um, lost someone uh, in death or whatever and so also remember um, a person that's dying, say for instance, a person in a hospital or something like that, not only would they be um, grieving, but their loved ones also would be um, experiencing um, some type of grief as well, um, you know, if that person. So um, we got different types or stage types of grief. So we got anticipatory grief. And so that occurs um, before the loss actually happens. So, for example, if you do have a person on hospice, and so anybody that's on hospice, the doctor has given them six months or less to live. And so anticipatory grief. So we're grieving the fact that we know we're about to um, lose our loved one. Or I'm grieving because I know I'm about to um, uh, pass away soon or whatever. So that's anticipatory grief. Dysfunctional grieving is grieving that falls out side normal responses um, and prolonged grieving is a person seems to be trapped in one stage and they can't progress um, can't get past this um, loss okay a person that's grieving they might experience a lot of different symptoms there's actually a box in your book 50, box 15.1 that talks about some of the symptoms that a person might be uh, experiencing that or that's grieving you know the person could have some depression some sadness crying uh, mood swings maybe they have a fatigue uh, maybe they're experiencing loneliness and isolation maybe they can't sleep having uh, uh, insomnia or something like that or maybe they sleeping all the time uh, maybe they can't eat and so they're losing weight uh, or uh, maybe there's a change in their sexual interest. Maybe they're having anxiety or shortness of breath, chest pains. Um, these are all signs and symptoms of, you know, grief. Um, forgetfulness. Uh, maybe they start making a lot of mistakes. Maybe they start having some confusion and disorientation. Uh, maybe they have an, um, symptoms of the same illness that the deceased person suffered. Um, they might start to sense the, their loved one's presence or hearing their voice or seeing their face, expecting the person to walk in, um, a need to tell and retell a memory uh, and remember the things about the loved one um, and the death experience. So, um, you know, different people could experience different things. And so um, these are just some things you might see in that person um, if they have an illness themselves maybe there's an exacerbation of that illness as well because they're so stressed out okay so like I said everybody's going to pass through the stages um, of grief at their own pace um, you know some people it may take longer than others um, typically according to, you, to your book um, it tends to peak at six months after the loss has occurred um, so they can have some disbelief, some yearning, some anger, some depression, and finally acceptance of the loss or whatnot. Um, so what you want to do as the nurse, you want to validate the loss of that grieving person. And how do you do that? Um, you reassure the grieving person that, um, that their loss was important. You know, let them know that their loss was important. Provide a quiet, warm environment for them. 
and uh, listen to the person. Sometimes they just want somebody to uh, listen to, you know, just listen to, you know, what they're saying or whatnot. They want to talk about their pain. They want to talk about their loved ones. Lo- loved ones that they lost um and so just you know be supportive in that um in that sense okay so when we have terminally ill patients we have some standards that we still need to provide in your book on the box 15.2 they go over some various standards um for example we won't go through all of them but let's just kind of look at a couple actively involved dying patients and their loved ones in the discussion of the end of life care within the acceptable cultural parameters so you want to um, make sure you include them you shouldn't be making decisions um, on your own without that person and their loved ones being involved in that process um, consider the terminally ill patients preferences what are their preferences what's their personality and lifestyle when we're um, making health care plans for them and whatnot. Uh, focus on the maintenance of functional capacity and alleviation of suffering. So we want to maintain their functioning um, as long as possible. And um, don't let them suffer. Control their pain. Control, you know, their pain should be controlled. Their symptoms should be controlled. And uh, allow them uh, the patient's preferences and intentions regarding health care as set outside in the advanced directives or the durable power of attorney for health care. Um, ensure the patient feels safe and secure. Provide them with opportunities to spend their final moments um, in a personal, personally meaningful way. Encourage family members and significant others to discuss their patient's uh, imminent death and their emotional needs with the nurse. Provide family members and significant others with private time with the patient. Allow family members to perform rituals and carry out their cultural um, customs. That's what we talked about in the culture of diversity. Um, you know, if they have some, you know, cultural rituals and things like that, when we're talking about, um, you know, death and dying, allow them to be able to, to do those things. And so, um, you know, like I said, we talk about asking, using open-ended therapeutic conversations remember when we talked about open-ended conversation open-ended conversation is uh, things that allow the person to further express themselves you know versus a closed-ended closed-ended it just you're looking for a specific answer yes or no or this or that uh, whereas open-ended we're allowing you know the patient and their families to um uh, express themselves so using open-ended therapeutic um, conversations when uh, talking with them and uh, making sure they had that private time with their loved ones and you know just able to the family and the patient able to express their um, feelings about how they're feeling you know with everything going on okay in your book box 15.3 goes over um, rights of a dying patient um, so, you know, the person that's dying has the right to be treated, um, as a person until they're, until they die, um, the right to have caring human contact, the right to be free of pain, the right to, um, maintain a sense of hope. You're, you know, you can still make sure that person has a sense of hope. You're not given false reassurance. We're not giving false reassurance and telling them, Oh, it's going to be okay. No, we're not doing that. But if, um, you know, if they still, you know, have hope, let them have, you know, their hope or whatnot. We're not going to take that away from them. Um, the right to cleanliness and comfort, the right to maintain, a, um, be respected and be, um, you know, cared for in a respectful manner. Um, you know, honest answers to their questions. Um, you know, explore change and change their religious beliefs as they if they want to you know if they um you know as they're dying they want to you know explore that or even change it that you know they have the right to the right to die with dignity um you know the right to die at home if they want to versus in a health care facility you know if they want to withdraw from social contact that's their right and so these you know you want to be mindful of these things you know 
for your if you're dealing with patients that are dying. Okay, hospice and palliative care. This is becoming more um, more widely used now. Palliative care is um, the goal is to reduce or relieve symptoms. So we're providing comfort measures um, without. Uh, we're not trying to do curative measures. We're not taking curative measures. We're not trying to cure the person. We're trying to uh, relieve their symptoms and make them uh, comfortable. Whereas hospice is also not curative. Uh, we're you know trying to comfort them. But with hospice, the doctor has given this person six months or less to live. When we're talking about hospice, they have been diagnosed as have, having six months or less to live. Um, so now when we're receiving these services, um, we're not doing curative measures. We're doing things to make them comfort. However, think about uh, they still may receive some treatments. For example, if you have a, say I had a cancer patient um, with a tumor on their lung. And that tumor was causing a lot of pain and a lot of difficulty breathing. Well, that's not um, relieving them symptoms and allowing them um, comfort and uh, pain free. So that person may receive radiation. If that radiation can shrink that tumor and decrease their pain and improve their breathing, then that is it's not going to cure their cancer, but it can help them be more comfortable. So they may see receive treatments in that manner, but they're not trying to cure the person, if that makes sense. So like I said, there's not one set way to grieve. There's no such thing as right and wrong as far as um, grieving or whatnot. Different people are going to go through it at different rates. Uh, but your book talks about Kubler-Ross's stages of um, uh, coping with death and so uh, in your book there's actually a table a nice table 15.1 that goes through each of the stages denial anger bargaining depression and acceptance so when we talk about denial that's the you know not me stage no this is not happening to me I, I don't have this terminal illness or whatever or I, I didn't you know just in denial um, anger, maybe you're angry with God, um, you know, why me, God, why, why did I have to get this diagnosis, why did you take my loved one, you know, type thing, um, bargaining, so bargaining is if, um, I'm starting to bargain, Lord, if you take this illness away, I promise I'll be good for the rest of my life, or I promise I'll go to church, you know, the rest of you know my days or whatever or you know if you take this away you know that's kind of bargaining type thing depression so when I'm in a depressed stage that's a feeling of just hopelessness um, you just have this great sense of loss or whatnot and then acceptance so acceptance is um, um, you could you could accept the disease um, as it is, you can accept the loss. Now, it doesn't mean you're happy, but you accept it. You're not angry about it. You accept it. Maybe even it's, okay, I accept it. Now I'm ready to do what I have to do to fight it. Um, you want to do this treatment? Let's do this treatment. I'm, I'm ready now. Or if it is a terminal illness, okay, I accept this, you know, and I'm, I can be at peace with it. Right, it's not that I'm happy about it, but um, I'm at a, at an accepting stage in in my life about it. Okay, so like I said before, it's okay to be supportive of a person that expresses hope if um if they've been given a terminal illness, and that can mean a lot of different things for a lot of different people. You know, they could be hopeful uh, that there's a cure. They could be hopeful. Um, that a treatment might be possible. They could be hopeful that maybe just their life could be prolonged a little bit longer. They could also be hopeful to just have a peaceful death. So it could be a lot of different things to a lot of different people. You want to all, again, 
allow them to, you know, open-ended conversations, ask open-ended questions, allow, you know, have practice that open-ended conversations to allow them to be able to express themselves is very important when we're talking about therapeutic communication with this, um, with these individuals. Okay, question one, hospice is a, a philosophy of care for the dying patient and the family. Which of the following is not true regarding hospice care? So the answer is for the focus of hospice is rehabilitation. Um, remember, hospice focuses on um, acceptance of death as a natural part of life. And so nurses provide comfort care for patients and support of, for their families. Um, so we're not trying to cure, we're not trying to rehab or anything with hospice. We're providing comfort measures. Okay, question two. As a nurse in a hospice setting, it is important to be familiar with the different stages of coping with death as identified by Dr. Kubler-Ross. Kelly goes into her patient's room. Her patient tells her, if I give $10,000 to the Humane Society, then maybe I might live to see my grandson. Which stage of coping is Kelly's patient in? And so this one is um, three, bargaining. So bargaining is the stage in which the, pa in which the patient believes that if I'm good, then I can get a reward. Okay, nurses need to be able to provide therapeutic communication during the, the dying process. So that means you need to be open to, to difficult questions um, that the patient might have about life and death um, and allow that person to um, discuss their feelings and needs. You need to have good listening skills, observation, um, able to use nonverbal communication, touch, um, and just your presence, um, you know, to help contribute to that therapeutic process. And, in order to provide therapeutic or effective care to patients and their families during the dying process, the nurse needs to be comfortable with his or her own beliefs and attitudes about dying. And then you need to learn um, about the dying process. You need to know about the dying process as well. Okay, so these are just some physical signs that you need to be aware of that death is impending and your patient is um, about to die very soon. Um, they start to physically get weaker. They spend a lot more time sleeping. All of their body functions start to slow down. Their appetite decreases. Um, their urine output decreases and becomes more concentrated. They may have edema in their extremities. Their pulse increases and becomes very weak and thready. Um, blood pressure starts to decrease. The skin starts to become mottled, cool, and dusky. And the respirations, they start to have chain Stokes respirations. And so chain Stokes respirations are um, shallow, irregular respirations. And the respirations uh, gradually become more and more shallow. And, um, and then they're followed by periods of apnea. Apnea is no breathing. Okay, so psychosocial and spiritual aspects of dying. And so um, as people um, start to approach death, um, maybe their spiritual needs start to become more important to them. Remember, it's never okay to impose your own religious and spiritual beliefs on a dying patient. Um, help them to find comfort and support in their own beliefs. Um, if they don't have any beliefs or anything, um, you can ask if they would like the chaplain to come. You won't, you don't just tell them, you know, I'm going to have the chaplain come. You can ask them if that's something that they would, would like or, or, or not. Um, but you're not going to, you're never going to impose your own religious um, and spiritual beliefs on any person just because they are um, dying. Be careful about making comments and things around people just because they're 
um, unconscious or unresponsive or in a coma, uh, they still may be able to hear you. So be careful about things that you say just because, um, you know, that person is um, unresponsive or whatnot. If a person wants to say goodbye to the, their loved ones or would not allow that, um, sometimes they just want to say goodbye. Sometimes they want to say, I'm sorry, please forgive me. I love you to, um, you know, individuals, allow them to be able to do that if they so choose. Um, sometimes also keep in mind our dying patients might have some confusion and disorientation um, as well, you know, during this dying process. Um you know, sometimes they want to know that, um, you know, sometimes they wait for, you know, their loved ones to say, it's okay to go. You know, us as your family, we got each other. We're going to take care of each other. And they want to know that their family is going to be okay. And, and, you know, for their family to be able to tell them that, uh, you know, it's okay. Um, and, and that's what they need to hear. Okay, advanced directives. When we talk about advanced directives, you have a living will and you have a durable power of attorney for health care. A living will is when you're of sound mind and body, you um, uh, create a document that says, when I'm no longer able to say what I want done for myself medically, this is what I want done for myself medically. And it's written in your document. A durable power of attorney for health care is when you're of sound mind and body, you um, appoint a health care proxy. You, and that's a person you appoint to say, when I'm no longer able to say what I want done for myself medically, this is the person. I appoint this person to make those medical decisions for me. Now, it has to be a durable power of attorney for health care. If a person is a durable power of attorney for finance, they cannot make health care decisions for you. So if you want them to make health care decisions for you, then uh, you have to make them uh, your durable power of attorney for health care. Um, also, you might have um, DNR, do not resuscitate orders. And so basically what that means is um, uh, if I uh, uh, stop breathing, my heart stops or, or my heart stops or whatever, um, you're not going to... Uh, perform CPR. Now, it doesn't mean a lot of people get it mixed up that thinking that, oh, they're not going to do everything to try to save my life, but they will try to, you know, do things to um, ensure you don't stop breathing. You know, they're going to do things to try to ensure you don't stop breathing, but should you stop breathing, they're not going to do um, CPR or whatnot. Now, you want to make sure you have that DNR in place. If a family or the patient tells you that they want DNR in place, but and the doctor has not, um, they haven't written those orders, it is not in writing, nothing's in writing about that, then they remain a full code. So if they should code before those papers get um, actually in writing, then you want to, they're a full code and you're going to treat them as such until you get, every, you know, all the proper paperwork in place. Okay, euthanasia. All right, so um, so euthanasia is ending another person's life to suffering uh, with voluntary or involuntary. So we have passive and active euthanasia. Passive euthanasia is when the patient um, just refuses all treatment. So uh, maybe they stop their to be whatever, you know, just refuse all treatments or whatnot. And so eventually they're going to um, pass away. Active euthanasia is when the physician administers um, a, a drug that is, um, that hastens a person's uh, death. So the physician administers something that hastens or quickens a person's death now this keep in mind this is um illegal uh you act active euthanasia is illegal then you have assisted suicide so assisted suicide when you have so we have um like physician assisted suicide physician assisted suicide is when the physician orders 
a lethal dose of a medication and the patient administers it to um, himself, himself or herself. Now, there is a handful of states um, that will allow physician-assisted suicide. And so the physician isn't actually giving it to the patient. They order it and um, the patient actually administers it to him or herself is physician-assisted suicide. Now, all of this is um, euthanasia and assisted suicide is um, considered a violation of the American Nurses Association code for nurses. So um, it is a violation for, you know, when we talk about um, the code of, uh, code of code for nurses. Okay, so pain control is critical for our patients that are um, at end of life. Um, if their pain is controlled, if their symptoms are relieved, they might not want to practice euthanasia or assisted suicide. A lot of times when people are in so much pain and agony and dealing with these symptoms, um, so much is just like, I just want to just end it all. I'm just tired of it and want to end it all. So if we can adequately manage their pain, adequately relieve their symptoms, um, you know, having someone there, you know, just to, to, to show you care or whatnot, that, then that can um, alleviate the desire to uh, practice euthanasia or assisted suicide as well. Okay, organs. We can donate organs and tissue. So organs that can be um, transplanted into other individuals are your kidneys, your liver, um, your heart, and your lungs. Tissues that can be transplanted are um, cornea, bone, and skin. And um, organs such as heart, lungs, and livers can only be trans um, obtained from a person that's um, on mechanical ventilation and suffered um, brain death. Other tissues can be removed for several hours after death, um, such as a massive heart attack or stroke or something like that. Um, you can indicate your desires to be an organ uh, organ donor um, on your driver's license or also in uh, in uh, advanced directives. But the next of kin must give permission to remove the organs or the tissue of a dead person. Okay, postmortem care after care after death. So you want that person looking as normal as possible for the family to come in and uh, view the body. So you're going to clean the person up, insert their dentures, close their mouth, close their eyes. Um, if they have an indwelling catheter, you want to remove the indwelling catheter. Any tubes, you want to remove any tubes, any tapes. If they do have dressings um, that are soiled, replace those dressings. Um, uh, cover the body up to the chin with a clean sheet, have their head elevated um, a little because you don't want them laying flat because then the blood will pull um, and cause discoloration in their face. So have their head up um, a little bit, um, collect all valuables to, you know, give to the family or whatnot. And um, like I said, you just want them looking as normal as possible when um, the family comes in to view the body. Question three, which of the following is a clinical sign that a patient is close to death? The answer here is um, chain stokes uh, respiration, chain stokes respirations. Um, question four, Maryland's hospice patient refuses treatment that might prolong her life. She is refusing IV fluids and antibiotics. This is an example of your answer here is pass passive euthanasia. So remember, passive euthanasia occurs when a patient refuses treatment that would prolong life. Prolong life. And uh, euthanasia is the act of ending another person's life to uh, end suffering. And so remember, it could be voluntary or involuntary um, with or without the person's consent. Active euthanasia is um, 
giving a drug or treatment to kill a patient. So the physician actually administers a drug that hastens the person's death. And then assisted suicide is making available a way to an end of um, a patient's life knowing the intent of suicide. So physician assisted suicide would be when the physician orders something in the physician and the patient gives administers it to himself or herself to hasten their death. Which of the following patients would be ineligible for organ transplant donation? And the answer here is going to be number two, the 16-year-old uh, cancer patients. And so donors have to be free of disease and cancer to be able to donate uh, organs 